The Bible reading this morning comes from Leviticus chapter 16. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two of Aaron's sons, when they approached the presence of the Lord and died. The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron that he may not come whenever he wants into the holy place behind the curtain in front of the mercy seat on the ark or else he will die because I appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Aaron is to enter the most holy place in this way with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He is to wear a holy linen tunic and linen undergarments are to be his, on his body. He is to tie a linen sash around him and wrap his head with a linen turban. These are holy garments. He must bathe his body with water before he wears them. He is to take them from the Israelite community, two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Aaron will present the bull for his sin offering and make atonement for himself and his household. <clears throat> Next, he will take the two goats and place them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. After Aaron casts lots for the two goats, one for the lot, one for the Lord, and the other for the uninhabitable place, he is to present the goat chosen by lot for the Lord and sacrifice it as a sin offering. But the goat chosen by the lot for an uninhabitable place is to be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement with it by sending it into the wilderness for an uninhabitable place. When Aaron presents the bull for his sin offering and makes atonement for himself and his household, he will slaughter the bull for his sin offering. Then he is to take a fire pan full of blazing coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense and bring them inside the curtain. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord so that the cloud of incense covers the mercy seat that is over the testimony or else he will die. He is to take some of the bull's blood and sprinkle it with his finger against the east side of the mercy seat. Then he will sprinkle some of the blood with his finger before the mercy seat seven times. When he slaughters the male goat for the people's sin offering and brings its blood inside the curtain, he will do the same with his blood as he did with the bull's blood. He is to sprinkle it against the mercy seat and in front of it. He will make atonement for the most holy place in this way for all their sins because of the Israelites' impurities and rebellious acts. He will do the same for the tent of meeting that remains among them because it's surrounded by their impurities. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time he enters to make atonement in the most holy place until he leaves after he has made the atonement for himself, his household, and the whole assembly of Israel. Then he will go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. He is to take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it on the horns on all sides of the altar. He is to sprinkle some of the blood on it with his fingers seven times to cleanse and set it apart from the, in, from the Israelites' impurities. When he has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting, and the altar, he is to present the live male goat. Aaron will lay both his hands on the head of the living goat and confess over it all the Israelites' iniquities and rebellious acts, all their sins. He is to put them on the goat's head and send it away into the wilderness by the man appointed for the task. The goat will carry all their iniquities into a desolate land and the man will release it there. Then Aaron is to enter the tent of meeting, take off the linen garments he wore when he entered the most holy place and leave them there. He will bathe his body with the water in a holy place and put on his clothes. 
Then he must go out and sacrifice his burnt offering and the people's burnt offering. He will make atonement for himself and for the people. He is to burn the fat on the sin of the sin offering on the altar. The man who released the goat for an uninhabitable place is to wash his clothes and bathe his body with water. Afterward, he may re-enter the camp. The bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to the most holy place to make atonement, must be brought outside the camp, and there hide, flesh and waste burned. The one who burns them is to wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. Afterward, he may re-enter the camp. This is to be a permanent statute for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you are to practice self-denial and do not work, both the native and the alien who resides among you. Atonement will be made for you on this day to cleanse you, and you will be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of complete rest for you, and you must practice self-denial. It is a permanent statute. The priest who is anointed and ordained to serve as high priest in place of his father will make atonement. He will put on the linen garments, the holy garments, and make atonement for the most holy place. He will make atonement for the tent of meeting and the altar, and will make atonement for the priests and all the people of the assembly. This is to be a permanent statute for you, to make atonement for the Israelites once a year because of all their sins. And all this was done as the Lord commanded Moses. Thanks, Lawrence. <clears throat> Now, it's worth remembering where we are in the story uh, of Israel. You know, Israel has been saved out of Egypt. They have left the land of slavery and God has set them aside as his people. He's promised them that they would be his people and he would be their God. And he's given them uh, this moral law, uh, the Ten Commandments. We looked at that for a few weeks. And then last week we saw how he gave them the instructions for how to build the tabernacle. Now, as we saw last week, the tabernacle was supposed to be a place where Israel could come and they could be in God's presence and they could meet with him. But as the tabernacle finishes, God comes down, he takes up residence in the tabernacle and, and we're left with this kind of baffling statement that Moses could not enter because God was there. The tabernacle had not quite worked. And as much as the story has been driving to up to this point, God and his people are still separated. Now, Israel was still at this point camped at the base of Mount Sinai. And they've been there for many chapters of the text, at the base of this mountain where God met with Moses and gave them the two stone tablets and the Ten Commandments on them. And so the book of Leviticus and the book of Numbers, uh, or at least half of it, all takes place while Israel is still camped at the base of this mountain. So the, the fleeing from Egypt and the path through the Red Sea and all of that stuff happens in a few short chapters. And then there's this long, long period of, of time of text, I guess, um, where God is describing for Israel how um, they are to live. And so today we're looking at the book of Leviticus as a whole. Uh, now, it's interesting because the book of Leviticus starts with the same problem as the one where, um, where Exodus ended where God is in the tabernacle, but the people can't come in. Now today we're going to be using a bunch of, of little snippets of pictures from the Bible Project. Um, uh, this is a great website resource if you want to check it out. They cover themes and whole books of the Bible. Um, and so these pictures hopefully are going to help us explore the book of Leviticus as a whole today. Now, the first one is this, and the problem is that, um, that God is holy. So God is this holy God and with him is life and goodness and justice and peace um, and he's in the middle of the camp and Israel is there too. But Israel is not that. Israel has sin, 
they commit evil, they don't obey God. And so the way the book of Leviticus works is it's kind of the arrow that, that helps Israel bridge the gap between their uncleanliness and God's holiness. And so when God calls Moses, he speaks to him from the tent of meeting. This is Leviticus 1. The Lord summons Moses and, speak, and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. So Moses, uh, it starts there at the same place that God is in the tabernacle and Moses is out. God speaks from out of, uh, he speaks from the tabernacle to Moses. Moses wasn't in the tent. He is not with God. God has to speak to him from the tabernacle tent. And the problem is still the same. God cannot be with his people. That's where the book of Leviticus starts. And that's what the book of Leviticus is all about. And so today we're going to be looking at it as a whole and we're going to speed up a, a little bit where, you know, we spent three weeks on the Ten Commandments. Now we're going to do a whole book in one sermon um, and we're just going to tackle this book. Now, we just need to be honest here. Leviticus is the book you normally quit at after your New Year's resolution, right? You know, we're swiftly approaching the New Year and the things we do at New Year's is we make these resolutions and Christians resolve to read their Bible more. So January 1, we open it up in Genesis 1, and it's great. It's a compelling story. It is rich with characters and drama and intrigue. And so by the end of January, you hit the end of Genesis, and you're thinking, this is great. I can do it. I'm reading more than a chapter a day. Thank you, Lord. And then February rolls around, and you read about the exciting escape of Israel out of Egypt, and we think this is great. Valentine's Day comes and you hit the Ten Commandments and it's all fine, you're very familiar with it. And then there's these 20 chapters of Exodus after it that describe the construction of the tabernacle and starting to think this is getting a bit boring. Um, but you push through, end of Feb, you get to the end of Exodus and you hit March and Leviticus and it's just, it's dry. And it's all instructions about grain offerings and sin offerings and bodily fluids and skin diseases. And we think, this is just so edifying to my heart. This is so life-giving to my soul and it really helps me live for Jesus every day. And so by the end of the first week of March, we shut the Bible and we go back to scrolling through Facebook, right? That's what happens. Now, I want you to be honest. Who here, hands up, gets excited about Leviticus? Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Let me ask you a second question. Who here has read the book of Leviticus? Okay. I'll settle for who here has heard of the book of Leviticus, right? It's three or four of you. That's good. That's good. Leviticus doesn't stir our souls. It does not excite us, but it should. It should. Because Leviticus lays the foundation for how God is going to deal with the problem of him being holy and Israel being not. How is he going to live with them in the middle of their camp? Leviticus teaches us all about God's holiness, about who we are, about how God deals with sin. And so as we take a look, these are the things that we're going to learn. Now the book of Leviticus is broken up into seven main sections with a little section tacked on at the end. And um, like much Hebrew writing, what's important about Leviticus is the center. Now we talked, I've mentioned this a couple of times, uh, this thing called a chiasm. It's a chiastic structure. Now how a chiasm works is that uh, there is a section that is introducing a topic and then there's a second section that answers that topic and you can have multiple layers of chiasms. But what the central thought, the middle of the chiasm, is the most important part. And the whole book of Leviticus is structured as a chiasm. So let me explain. In the first section, this is chapters 1 through to 7, they all deal with ritual sacrifices. So chapter 1 to 7 is all about ritual sacrifices. Now half of these sacrifices were, uh, were about free will sacrifices. They were a way for God's people to come and to thank God for his provision, for his blessing, for what he's done for them. These are the ones on the left here. They're the grain offerings, the fellowship offerings. 
The second half of the ritual sacrifices have to deal with sin offerings. These are offerings that were offered in response to individual Israelites realizing their sin and wanting to seek God's forgiveness for their sins. And so this was a way for them to say they're sorry. There's a way for them to say they're sorry. And so the Bible, um, so, so there were these burnt offerings, these purification offerings, these restitution offerings, and that's what's happening in the second half of these first couple of chapters. And what Leviticus is doing here, it's describing a system of rituals for everyday people to live everyday life with God in their camp. You know, friends, we're, we're supposed to live in a relationship with God. We're meant to be people who want to share with God what's going on in our lives. If we want to thank Him, He's providing a way for them to do it. These grain offerings, these Thanksgiving offerings. Um, if, if, we're, if things go wrong, we need to talk to God about that. If we are seeking uh, forgiveness for sin, God is providing a way to do that. He's saying, um, you know, if there's a good harvest, if things are going well, offer a Thanksgiving offering. If you have sinned, uh, even unintentionally, you know, you might transgress the God's commands. How do you deal with that? Well, says God, here's a way, a ritualistic way for you to deal with that. Sin offerings, burnt offerings, purification offerings, restitution offerings. But what we have to remember is that all of these sin offerings, they're, they're all offerings that offer animals. They were sacrifices where the blood of the animal, as it is being slaughtered, very visually reminds Israel of what it's costing for their sin to be dealt with. These animals had to be slaughtered and their blood flowed to remind Israel what it costs to deal with their sin. And so chapter 1 through to 7 deals with the ritual sacrifices. Now the corresponding part of the chiasm is the ritual feasts. These happen in chapters 23 to 25, so at the end of Leviticus. Um, They lay out all the feasts and the days that Israel were supposed to observe. And it starts off with the Sabbath day, which is interesting, right? It's interesting that God reminds Israel of their annual feasts by starting with the Sabbath day, a day of rest, a day of peace. Now remember what the Sabbath day was all about when God um, institutes it on the seventh day of creation. This is the day when God enters into creation to come and enjoy it, to live in it. It's the day that God comes to dwell with his creation. And Israel is meant to be reminded that this whole system is about what God is doing. He's coming to live with his people. He's entering into the people he is now creating. This whole ritualistic system was a way for him to, to do exactly what was happening on the Sabbath day, a way to join together and be in relationship with one another like it was in Genesis. After the Sabbath day is introduced, uh, these chapters go through the various, the seven annual feasts they were to, um, to celebrate. He gives them instructions for how the Passover works, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the annual celebration that reminds them how God saved them out of Egypt. He's saying this is the, this every year you are to be reminded that I am the one who saved you. Following that is the Feast of First Fruits, which reminds Israel every year that God is the one who gave them the promised land and that every good gift we have is ultimately from Him. Then there's the Feast of Weeks, which is the one during which Pentecost happens and and the Holy Spirit ultimately comes during that festival many thousands of years later. And there's the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, which we read about today, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, what's important is to remember that these festivals set out the Israelite calendar. Their entire year was designed to continually remind them who they were who they were worshipping, and why. And so that's what the ritual feasts are all about. Now the second main section that we need to deal with is about the priesthood. So chapters 8 through 10 describe how the priests are supposed to be ordained. You know, in chapter 8 and 9, God sets aside the priest Aaron and his sons 
And so Aaron goes through this whole rigmarole of offering uh, sacrifices for himself. He, he offers a sacrifice to cleanse himself from his sin and, and he goes through this great big job of following all the commandments that have been set out for him so that he could be clean. And then in chapter 9, Aaron and Moses actually, after having been cleansed, they actually finally get into the tent of meeting where God is and they don't get zapped. They don't die. They survive God's presence and Aaron comes out as a priest now approved by God. He blesses the people and there's this great celebration as the Israelites, um, you know, as they, as they celebrate. And so that's what happens in chapters 8 and 9. And so Aaron and his sons are set apart. But the problem is that in chapter 10, what happens is that Aaron's sons, they go into the ark of uh, the tent of meeting and they offer this unauthorized fire. They mess with the way the tabernacle is supposed to work. They come before God and they get consumed by God's fire. They get destroyed. And the text makes it very clear that they are burnt up by the fire that comes out of God's presence. They die because God is holy and they were not. And as they enter into his presence in their unholiness, they are consumed by his purity and his glory. And we are reminded again that being in God's presence is this awesome privilege. You cannot approach God without reverence and fear and awe because of your sin. You deserve to be destroyed. You can't enter his presence until you have been purified and cleaned and your sins have been atoned for. And so the corresponding section then deals with the qualifications for priests in chapters 21 and 22. Leviticus here describes in great detail all the things that set the priests aside. They were you know, supposed to be the purest of the people, their children had to be pure. Their offerings had to be pure. They had to have this exceptionally high moral integrity. They had to be ritualistically pure because as far as it depended on them, they were to be the holiest of people because they couldn't be like Aaron's sons who got burnt up and consumed. Now, there's a very good reason for this. Because the priests were meant to be this go-between between between God and his people. And so if they were going to represent the people to God, they had to be pure so they don't get zapped. But if they were to be representing God to the people, they had to represent his holiness, his justice, his moral character and so on. And so they were these in-between people that stood between Israel and God. And so their qualifications for priesthood were very important. And then the final section uh, that kind of rounds out the three sections in, um, in Leviticus is about purity. In chapters 11 to 15, it's about ritual purity. Now, these are rules about weird stuff, lists of things that made Israel unpure, or impure or ritualistically unclean. Contact with bodily fluids, with skin diseases, if you touched mold, that was a problem. If you came into contact with a dead body or you ate an impure animal or these sorts of things, they made you ritualistically impure. And this is weird to us because we don't live in the Israelite society. But to Israel, these things um, were all associated with, with death. These unclean things, these impure things, were things of death and therefore separated them from God's presence. You see, God is a God of life. And so to be ritualistically unclean is a problem. You can't be in God's presence if you're contaminated with death. And so these chapters go into great detail as to how you could be cleansed ritualistically uh, when you had become unclean so that you can be with the God of life. And then on the flip side, uh, the, the, the other section, the corresponding section, deals with moral purity. So ritual purity and then moral purity. Now, if there was one phrase that could describe this section of Leviticus, it would be this. Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. 
In these chapters from 18 to 20, it describes again in detail how Israel was supposed to be a holy people. You know, if Israel was to be in Canaan, they were to be different from the Canaanites. They had to live a life that was characterized by different things than the lives of the, of the Canaanites. And so the particular things, you can kind of group them into three things. They were to care for the, pure, uh, for the poor, they had to have sexual integrity, and they had to be a people of social justice. Israel was supposed to be different from the, from the people of the land they were entering into. And so this section deals with moral purity. Now, at the very center then of Leviticus, at the middle of the chiasm, we find the Day of Atonement. And there it is, right in the middle, chapter 16 and 17, is the Day of Atonement. Now, Israel had all kinds of ways of offering sacrifices for their own sins, but it wasn't enough. The people were still sinful, and so God provides this one day, once a year, where the sins of Israel would be properly dealt with, the Day of Atonement. And it's a very special day. It's important for us, because on the Day of, the, uh, the day of Atonement gives us perhaps the clearest indication in the Old Testament of what is required for our sin to be forgiven and what Jesus accomplishes on the cross. The Day of Atonement teaches us the two ways in which Jesus deals with our sin. And so on this day, there are these two goats that are offered. The first was a purification offering. So this goat would be a perfect animal. It would be slaughtered for the sins of the people, and then the blood would be sprinkled over the atonement cover on the ark, the mercy seat. And this blood would literally separate the requirements of the law from God. So God was, his presence is in the cloud above the mercy seat. The law, the Ten Commandments are underneath, and the blood of this animal covers the requirements of the law, covers their sin, therefore, from God's sight. And so the blood of this offering was to stand between God's holiness and purity uh, and the people's sin. And that's what Jesus' blood does for us. It covers us. It stands between our impurity and sin and God's holiness. The reason we have access to God, the reason why the temple curtain is torn in two from top to bottom when Jesus dies, is because we are covered by Jesus' blood eternally. The blood of the Lamb, it works. And so that's the first goat. The second goat is the scapegoat, the goat for the uninhabitable place. Now, we don't actually know what that phrase means. Uh, it it's Azazel in, uh, in the original text, and Azazel might be a demon. We don't know. It's a bit tricky to translate that. So the best we can come up with is that this goat is sent out of the camp into a place, whether it goes to some sort of bad guy or it goes out into the wilderness, it doesn't really matter. The point is that what happens to the scapegoat is that it takes away the sins of the people. It takes the sin out of the camp. It was a very visual way to show how God removes the sin from his people. And so what happens is that after the people's sins are covered by the blood of the first goat, the sins of the people would be ceremonially put on this scapegoat and he would be sent into the wilderness and taken out of the camp. I really like this little picture because look at the goat there. He has no idea what's going on. Just question mark over his head. But anyway, this goat gets sent out of the camp into the wilderness. And that's what Scripture says happens to our sin too. When Jesus dies and he covers us, he takes our sin as far away as the east is from the west. Never to be seen again, never to return. That's the day of the atonement. That's the center of the book of Leviticus. And then there's this final little section at the end, which is chapters 26 and 27. And there's this call to obedience, call to covenant faithfulness. 
Once this whole sacrificial system is set up, once it's all established by God, God tells them what will happen if they break the covenant he has made with them. He tells them that they need to be faithful to him in response to what he's done for them. And if they do, they're going to get tons of blessings. There's going to be rain, there's fruitfulness, they will prosper as a people, they'll have military conquest, they're going to have great success, it's going to be great. But if they disobey, if they adulterate themselves with the idols of the land, God says that he will send enemies to punish them. And ultimately they will be thrown out of the land of promise. But even in the midst of that, in chapter 26, verse 40, he gives Israel hope. He says, if they will confess their sins, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and Isaac and Abraham, and I will remember the land that I have promised to them. And he says that even though Israel will one day be in exile because of their sin, God says, yet in spite of this, I will not reject them or abhor them and so destroy them completely, breaking my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. For I will remember the covenant I made with their ancestors when I brought them out of Egypt to be assigned to the nations. Because you see, as powerful and as effective as this priestly system was, God knows that Israel's heart hasn't really changed. They will disobey. Ultimately, they will reject him. And yet he will bring his people back. And that then sets the, re- the scene for the rest of the story of Israel. And so that's the book of Leviticus. It's pretty interesting, isn't it? But now there's one more verse we have to read. Verse 1 from the book of Numbers. The Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting. On the first day of the second month, of the second year after Israel's departure from the land of Egypt. The Lord spoke to Moses in the tent. Leviticus starts out with Moses not being able to enter. Verse 1, chapter 1, God speaks from the tent. Numbers 1, verse 1, God speaks to Moses in the tent. Moses is there with God in the tabernacle. The system works. And so finally, Israel lives with their God, provided Israel is cleansed from their sin. And that's it, that's the book. Now what does this have to do with us? Four quick thoughts. Firstly, Leviticus shows us how important holiness is to God. Holiness is part of God's character and so As a child of his, we are to be holy too. We're set apart from this world. Just as God is different from the world, he sets us apart from the world. And so our lives should look different to the lives of those those around us. Does it? Are we holy as God is holy? Second thought. Sin is costly to repay. Sin is totally against God. So if we willfully sin, we are willfully choosing death as children of life. If anything, Leviticus shows us how gory, how gruesome, how terrible the price is for us to be free from sin. When we sin, We spit in the face of Christ who died for us like one of these sacrifices whose blood flowed. Sin is costly to repay. Think about that the next time you consider it. Thirdly, it shows us that being God's child will make us stand out. Israel was meant to be this beacon of light to the nations, saying, look, this is how good it is to be one of God's people. 
Christians are the same. We are called to live differently than the world. Our lives should look different so that people can see how good God is. So will you obey the commands that he gives you to show the world how good God is? Does Jesus mean that much to you? And finally, Leviticus shows us God's grace. Forgiveness is possible through Jesus. At the end of Leviticus, he already promises that he's going to remember his covenant even though he knows Israel will disobey. And when Jesus died on the cross, he did so for you, knowing that you would still sin. So forgiveness is possible through him. And he is faithful even until today. And we can celebrate in that. If we sin, if we fail to keep his commands, forgiveness is open. Because, though, because through the lamb that was slain, our sins are forgiven. And through the lamb that was sent out of the camp, our sins are taken away. I think that's exciting. And so that's Leviticus. I suggest you try and read it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for, I guess in some ways, this enigmatic book, uh, which is difficult for us to read, difficult for us to understand, difficult for us to grasp in places. But as we, I guess, step out a little bit from the trees and look at the forest, Lord, we are just reminded about how faithful and uh, you are to your people how you've put these things in place to point us ultimately to Christ, the one who saves us from our sin, who, whose blood stands between us and your holy presence, the one who cleans us from our sins and takes our sin out of the camp so that we can have a relationship with you. I just want to praise you for that. We pray that as we consider these things, you will give us... Um, and you remind us and drive this truth deep into our hearts so that when we consider sin, we will remember the tabernacle and the one to whom it pointed. And so we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.